Hello, today we will discuss diabetic autonomic neuropathy. So you see this word is composed of three things. We have diabetes, we have the autonomic system, and we have neuropathy, meaning ner nerve damage, nerve disease. So we have a dysfunction of one or more nerves. And interestingly, uh, uncontrolled high blood sugar in diabetes damages nerves and interferes with their ability to send the signals that the nerves usually do, leading to something we call diabetic autonomic neuropathy. We can classify it into subclinical or clinical depending on if we have symptoms or not. So clinical is when we have symptoms. And the clinical symptoms are many. And we will list all the uh, symptoms that we know depending on which, sy uh, which uh, system it affects. So if we dig deeper, we can say that the autonomic nerves are mainly affected in the later stages of diabetes. And these work unconsciously and they regulate many body functions such as controlling the bladder, the intestinal tract, the sex organs. So the effects of this diabetic autonomic neuropathy then evolves all these symptom, uh, systems and therefore create symptoms uh, for the urologic symptoms, they create gastrointestinal symptoms, cardiovascular system, pupillary systems, and so on. And generally, the treatment aims to prevent the disease progression, and that includes reducing the risk factors, such as hyperglycemia, so high blood sugar, smoking, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and so on. And then we can, of course, give medicines depending on what symptoms the patient has. So, now let's discuss how this diabetic autonomic neuropathy affects each organ system and how we treat these complications. We will just deal superficially with the treatment here. First, we will discuss uh, and consider how diabetic autonomic neuropathy affects the cardiovascular system. So the cardiovascular system, when it's affected, then we call it cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy. And it is the most clinically important because it manifests as damage to the autonomic control of your heart, of your cardiovascular system. So not your heart, only the heart, but all the cardiovascular system. And that can have very, very tragic events. So we have autonomic fibers now that are connected to the heart or to the blood vessels, and this results in heart rate control abnormalities. And such damage includes a high heart rate, during rest, for example, we have exercise intolerance, we have silent myocardial ischemia and orthostatic hypotension. So a silent myocardial ischemia is a condition now where we have a reduced oxygen-rich blood flow to the heart. And that occurs in the absence of any chest discomfort. At the same time, we have orthostatic hypotension. This is a fall in the blood pressure in response to the change in the body position. So for example, from laying down uh, and then standing quickly, then you have this drop in blood pressure. And we will see, we, we have many tests that we can do to check this out. So we have uh, the symp uh, sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So this is what we have in the nervous system, two system. And the sympathetic nervous system activates the fight or flight response during a threat or perceived danger. And then the parasympathetic nervous system restores the body to a state of calm. And the heart is connected to both of these systems. Therefore, there are tests for each since independent tests produce then better results. So tests involving the sympathetic system include, for example, beat-to-beat -beat blood pressure response to a Valsalva maneuver. And then we have another thing called systolic and diastolic blood pressure change in response to a tilt table testing or to an active standing. And tests for the parasympathetic function of the heart include heart rate variability, to a deep breathing, okay? And this heart rate response, we have also to a standing, and then we have heart rate response to a Valsalva maneuver. So we have many things here we can do. So in the, sta in the standard Valsalva maneuver, the patient lies down, facing upward, connected to an ECG monitor, and then he forcibly exhales for 15 seconds against a fixed resistance with an open glottis. So it's like when you're going to the toilet, okay? In the test of the heart rate variability in the deep breathing, the patient lies quietly and breathes deeply at a rate of about six breaths per minute. And this produces a maximum variation in heart rate while a heart monitor records this difference between the maximum and the minimum heart rate. Then we have the heart rate response to a standing test. And this will evaluate the cardiovascular response caused by a change from the horizontal 
to a vertical position in healthy people. And there's a characteristic and rapid increase in heart rate in response to standing in normal people. While in patients with diabetes here uh, and autonomic neuropathy, there's only a gradual increase in heart rate. And that's the difference between disease patient and healthy patients. So there are also other tests for heart function, such as we have quantitative pseudomotor axon reflex testing. Very complicated word, I know. And then we have also sympathetic skin response. Then we have thermoregulatory sweat testing. So let's start with quantitative pseudomotor axon reflex test or sweat test. Uh, sweat test. This will measure the nerves that control sweating and the test involves a mild electrical stimulation on the skin allowing acetylcholine, a naturally occurring chemical, to stimulate your sweat glands. And this quantitative pseudomotor axon reflex test measures the volume of sweat produced by this stimulation. Then we have the sympathetic skin response. This is a technique that records the changes in skin conductance after the activation of these sweat glands in areas of the skin that are rich in sweat glands. Okay? Then, then we have this thermoregulatory sweat test. This will now measure your ability to sweat in a unique we have a laboratory controlled uh, setting where we measure the temperature, the humidity, the airflow regulation and all, uh, all the things. First, patients have an area of the skin, usually on the hands or the feet or the arms or the legs. And then we dust it with powder and that respond to moisture by changing the color. And next, then the patient sits or lies down in a warm and moist room and then we encourage sweating in this setting and we will see the degree of color change at the end of the test and that will be proportional now to the amount of sweat produced and which in turn now is proportional to the nerve activity and then we know how good the nerves function. Second, we have to consider now how diabetic autonomic neuropathy affects the peripheral nerves. We dealt with heart, now let's take a look at peripheral nerves. And this can contribute to foot ulceration, which is commonly known as diabetic foot. So peripheral autonomic nerve dysfunction has symptoms such as aching, there's pulsation, itching, there's tightness, cramping, there's a dry skin, loss of the nails, peripheral edema and Charcot arthropathy. This is a syndrome where we have uh, peripheral neuropathy or this loss of sensation in the foot and in the ankle and therefore this will be a damaged foot. Okay? Skin biopsy assessment can also be done uh, where we measure uh, the small fiber neuropathy. Good. Now let's look at quantitative pseudomotor axon reflex test. This can detect early signs of damage to nerves also. Not only the heart but we can look at, at peripheral nerves here. So the treatment of peripheral autonomic neuropathy mainly centers now on the care for foot care. Okay, to prevent this foot infection, to prevent the foot ulceration and so on. Now, uh, let's look at the third thing. We have uh, the gastrointestinal system. So gastrointestinal system can be affected. Its significant effects on the digestive system include what? Gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, abbreviated as GERD. We have gastroparesis. So this is a slowing of the uh, stomach emptying. And then we have chronic diarrhea. So the most common symptoms of GERD now are heartburn with acid reflux. And the GERD is diagnosed by an upper endoscopy. We have an acid pH probe test. We have also esophageal manometry. And we have an X-ray of your upper digestive system. The treatments of GERD will include medications like cimetidine, for example, antacids, so against acids, and proton pump inhibitors such as lansoprazole, for example, and then surgery. Uh, if very severe, okay? Now, let's look, take a look at uh, gastroparesis. We're still at the gastrointestinal system and this includes symptoms of nausea, vomiting, early satiety, bloating, upper abdominal pain. And in short, the diagnosis is based on the delayed gastric emptying seen on scintigraphy. This is a machine. This is a scan that can detect the period it takes for the food to move from your upper digestive tract Downwards. And the speed at which this occurs and the quantity of food movement can identify any upper gastric uh, motility problems. And the primary treatment now includes improving, uh, first of all, the blood glucose levels. We need to improve diabetes, diet regulation, medicines uh, for the symptoms, for example, antiemetics against the symptoms like vomiting and nausea, 
prokinetic medications like metoclopramid promoting movement of the bowels and so on. So symptom-based treatment here. So first the cause and then the symptom-based. Diarrhea can occur in diabetes, as we said, particular dose with advanced disease. So often the diarrhea is watery, it is painless and happens usually at night. And management of this is uh, general stuff like hydration, drink a lot of water, anti-diarrheal -diar uh, medication, correction of electrolyte deficiencies or nutrient deficiencies and so on. Now, let's look at the other part, genitourinary system, so the urinary tract system. Interestingly, symptoms here that affect the system, uh, this system may be actually present in up to 50% of uh, patients with diabetes. And these are responsible for several syndromes, including bladder dysfunction with retrograde ejaculation for males, erectile dysfunction for males, and painful intercourse. So this is also not the funny, uh, funny thing. So diabetic patients can have all these things. And for example, diabetic bladder dysfunction starts as a decreased ability to sense the full bladder. That will lead to infrequent urination, which will then be incomplete in emptying, leading to urinary tract infections and abdominal pain. Now, sexual dysfunction, as we said, is also very common, but it is more common in women with diabetes compared with women without diabetes. Okay, so when we're dealing with women, it's more common in diabetes patients. And we have retrograde ejaculation in males, and this can be seen with, as cloudy urine after sex due to the presence of sperm, and this can lead to impotence. And these symptoms, actually, and the knowledge that the patient has diabetes for a long time can be enough to make the diagnosis of diabetic autonomic neuropathy. So this all is included in diabetic autonomic neuropathy. We have different tests here, post-void residual test and urodynamic studies. And the post-void residual test is done with an ultrasound and after using the washroom, the patient will then lie flat on the exam table with the surface of their lower abdomen and pelvis exposed now. The te technician goes now, the doctor goes there, uh, puts some gelatin in there and then he will check it with ultrasound. And the ultrasound probe in this area will make the recording and we will see how the bladder is functioning, how much uh, uh, urine there is in the bladder. The urodynamic studies are taken during filling and emptying. So we have a, dig a digital equipment here and we can measure the urine flow and the pressure in the bladder or in the rectum and then we use, it, use an x-ray to look at it. Treatment now consists of strict voluntary urinary urination schedule. We are frequently coupled with crede maneuver. Crede maneuver is done by manual pressure on the abdomen at the location of the bladder, just below the navel. And, uh, and, and then we have advanced cases where we have also uh, intermittent catheterization, which is we insert and a catheter and then we remove it several times a day to empty the bladder. But that's the last part, the last stage. The problems with erection now can be treated with medications or devices and the management for, for example, female sexual dysfunction uh, should be, of course, uh, tailored to the specific sexual concerns. So we need to talk with the woman here or a psychologist. Finally, uh, let's look at the pupils now. So the pupils, we have two main dysfunctions here. First, we have the pupillomotor function impairment, which means the muscle controlling the eye's pupil is affected. Then we had, uh, and this can lead to then impaired vision. Secondly, we have something called argul robertson pupils. And uh, these argul robertson pupils are very small, bilateral, meaning on both sides, and they are reduced in size on a near object, but they do not constrict when we expose it to a bright light. So pupillometry is used to diagnose uh, these eye dysfunctions and especially this needed here to offer the best treatment. Then other symptoms of a diabetic autonomic neuropathy include, for example, we have anxiety, we have depression, we have sleep apnea, we have potentially serious sleep disorders in which the breathing uh, repeatedly stops and starts and so on. Hypoglycemia, for example, is uh, also present and we have patients who are unaware of this. So it's also another complication of diabetes in this that the patient is completely unaware that he has uh, a low blood, uh, blood glucose and this uh, will generate symptoms of uh, uh, like, for example, palpitations, we have sweating and anxiety, general, general symptoms. Now, if you want to make a summary now, we can say 
that uh, diabetic autonomic neuropathy is very, very uh, severe complication. And it's very, very annoying complications because it affects many, many body systems. It affects, as we said, cardiovascular system, causing a high heart rate during rest, exercise intolerance. We have silent myocardial ischemia, which is very dangerous, can cause heart uh, uh, infarction. Then we have orthostatic hypotension, so a low blood pressure due to elevating the body system. Then we have the Peripheral nerves, as we said, uh, causing foot ulcerations with aching, pulsation, itching, tightness, cramping, dry skin with peripheral edema, loss of the sensation of the foot and the ankle. Then we have the gastrointestinal systems, uh, mainly GERD, so uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. We also have gastroparesis, meaning that the stomach emptying is very slow. And then thirdly, the chronic diarrhea in patients with diabetes. Then the next system was the urinary system uh, or the genital system where we have bladder dysfunction, we can have a retrograde ejaculation, we can have an erectile dysfunction for maize and painful uh, intercourse. Finally, we have uh, those that affect the uh, eyes in two ways. We have the pupillomotor function impairment and the argul robertson pupils. And the treatment now of this diabetic autonomic neuropathy is focused on preventing the, this disease. So we want to prevent diabetes. That's the first, first important thing to do. We need to reduce all the risk factors that we have. Some patients will also, as we discussed, have many uh, symptoms. We need to treat it with medicines uh, and, and, and all, all depending on which symptoms the patient develops. So uh, please remember now, diabetic autonomic neuropathy. Diabetic autonomic neuropathy. This is not uh, exotic disease. The name itself is very exotic, is very strange, very confusing, but the disease itself is not exotic. It is very common. We have a diabetic patient with an autonomic nervous system problem, meaning that the nerves are not giving the pulsations as they should. And therefore, as we know, all the nerves are connected in the body of the cardiovascular system, gastrointestinal, urinary tract, the eyes, and so on, sweating as we talked. So therefore, it is very, very uh, annoying for patients since they have a diabetes that can cause all these kinds of symptoms. And therefore, I always say that diabetes is tragically a disease that affects almost the whole body. Thank you very much for listening. Take care. Bye-bye.